My name is Ryan Polnow from the Flower and Water Hospitality Group, and you're listening to Ingredient Insiders. This is Ingredient Insiders. I'm John Magazino. And I'm Andrea Parkins. On each episode of Ingredient Insiders, we'll be talking with chefs and authors about their favorite ingredients. We'll then be speaking to the producer of that ingredient. We'll learn about how it's made, its history, and why chefs love to use it in their restaurants. Today, we are in the beautiful city of San Francisco. Andrea, do you like San Francisco? Do you love San Francisco? I love San Francisco. I think it has an amazing food scene. I think it's beautiful. Um, I like, I take, I took the ferry here from a friend's house. I mean, I love it. We're going to be talking today with uh, the chef and owner of Flower and Water Restaurant and Penny Roma Restaurant. Uh, Thomas McNaughton, who's just an awesome chef. He is beloved in San Francisco. They are just doing a lot of amazing, I want to say Italian food, Mm -hmm. not necessarily traditional, but just, you know, there is definitely tradition um, in the food, but they're just doing some amazing stuff. And I think what's interesting about that is when you are asking an Italian chef what they want to talk about on Ingredient Insiders, and they come back to you and they say, I'd like to talk about miso. I was shocked. Yeah, today's ingredient is miso, which I think most of us associate with Asian food and Japanese food. Um, But Thomas, who, you know, really him and his team are really the, you know, some of the best pasta makers in the country. Um, I'm so excited for this conversation. But, you know, by the way, you mentioned San Francisco and a food, you know, a food city. Mm hmm. You know, we had some incredible tacos this morning at La Taqueria. What did you think of those? I thought they were so good. I mean, I, anytime I travel, you know, I'm always seeking out, you know, where, where is the best taco? Um, We did it in LA. um, And then for you to take me to Taqueria in San Francisco, it was, it's an institution. I mean, you can tell that, you know, it's a well-oiled machine. um, And I know for you, it's a place that like, you don't leave without eating a taco from, from La Taqueria. Yeah, there's a few things. San Francisco, because you mentioned it, it's a, it's a food centric town for sure. Yeah. And what I love about it is all these small kind of independent things that sprouted up here. Um, you know, Suvla Restaurant, Charles Belilis, who we've had on the program. Yeah. Um, you know, a Greek concept that is just so amazing. Or Tartine, the bakery. I mean, it's it, these are landmark places now in San mm-hmm. Francisco. There's so yep. much great food here. Um, and the yeah, farmers I'm a fan market. of um, Hog Island Oyster Bar. Oh yeah, that's that's my place. I've only been to San Francisco a few times, but every time I go, I get a dozen oysters there. That's yeah, I, I love it. So we're also going to be talking with Kevin Gondo and Elena Sue from Shared Cultures. They're actually the folks that make this artisanal miso. Um, which Thomas McNaughton, you know, I, I, Thomas is using his cooking. I can't wait to hear how he's using it, but um, they've got a, you know, a boutique miso company here in San Francisco. So I cannot wait to hear from them. Yeah. I want to learn how they got into that, what inspired them. Um, I think, you know, when you, when we think about miso, there's only, there's a few kinds you have to go to an Asian market. So I think I'm um, having this, to your point, a boutique business for chefs to leverage in the San Francisco area. I think it's amazing. I can't wait to talk to them. This is the Miso episode. Cannot wait, San Francisco. Here we come. This episode is in partnership with the Chef's Warehouse and produced by Gotham Production Studios. I'm pretty stoked today because not only do we have two amazing San Francisco chefs in the room, but there, there's a pile of food in front of us, Andrew. Ingredients, I should say, that you guys are actually going to cook for us here? Because that's never happened before. Yeah, this is anyone, the first time. anyone that enters Flower and Water should eat some pasta before they exit. God bless you. So we're talking today with uh, co chefs Thomas McNaughton and Ryan Polnow of Flower and Water in San Francisco, this epic restaurant. You guys have been how long now? So 13 years. It's been amazing. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Nice. You guys look so young too. How is uh, that possible? We don't feel young. Yeah, I don't you feel don't young feel at all. Young. It's the knees that really go. <laughs> but in the past 13 years, you have a lot going on. Tell us about all the concepts surrounding us here. Yeah. There's a pizzeria. Yeah. The, uh, talk to us. Yeah. So um, 
13 years ago, it started with a small little, what we thought was going to be a neighborhood restaurant, flour and water. Um, fast forward to now a year and a half, two years ago, we rebranded the entire company flour and water hospitality group. Um, and you know, we're on 20th street right now. And so on 20th street, uh, we have flour and water trick dog bar flour and water pasta shop, which is our kind of like deli and, and, uh, you can buy pasta by the pound. Um, and then behind that sits Penny Roma. Um, and Penny Roma opened around eight months ago and we are moving flour and water pizzeria from the mission to a new flagship location um in north beach in the old rose pistola which is like a, a very historic uh epic old san francisco restaurant so a very, lot going on very never cool. a dull moment yeah and the most exciting news on that is the expansion into consumer packaged goods so we were talking about this earlier you guys are going to start making pasta right. that people all over the united states can buy and pizza right. So uh, pizza, pizza, pizza and, pasta, and pasta, but, but pasta will uh, be released first. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is amazing. So you're, I mean, Flower and Water is famous for their pasta. Right. Um, I know you worked with Michael Tusk, uh -huh. who I consider a great pasta maker. Mm -hmm. You guys have both cooked and traveled the world together. Talk to us about your history. Yeah. Thomas, you grew up in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So Ryan. we tried to hide that. I thought we <laughs> yeah. talked about oh, it. We, we weren't going to gonna mention <laughs> no, that. No, be proud. Be proud. No, no. South Jersey. South, South Jersey, Jersey. Not North Jersey. Jersey, South Jersey. You know? Nothing yeah. wrong with Jersey. I mean, <laughs> I'm from New York. I don't go there. Jersey but that's proud. Okay. You just yeah. lost listeners from yeah. North yeah, Jersey. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> we love New Jersey. Um, and Ryan, you grew up in the Bay Area. How did you guys meet? So uh, I was working at a, another restaurant here in the, in the city, and uh, a co-worker of mine had moved on to cook at Flower and Water. And she was just in love with the whole, the whole vibe of the restaurant, the quality of the food, everything that Thomas was doing at the time. And this was uh, the end of 2011. And she was like, hey, you should come just check it out. And I was like, happy with where I was. I was, my next move was gonna be like, I wanna get into that three star Michelin fine dining, serve 30 people a night. I was like, yeah, I'll come, I'll, I'll come hang out in the kitchen and uh, fell in love with what I saw, but wasn't after uh, a transition at that time. Tom sat me down at the communal table in Flower and Water, and he thought I was trying out for a job, like a traditional stage. Mm -hmm. And we went through this interview process where I didn't feel comfortable to interject and say like, hey man, I'm just hanging out for the day. <laughs> um, but that led to like a good conversation. That conversation led to uh, me being intrigued by what Flower and Water's doing because there's a lot of those like fine dining cooking techniques and approach to food, but in a very approachable, casual, and, and really fun setting. Um, so that was the day that I met my soulmate, <laughs> <laughs> my, my work wife, you know? Um, so fast forward to March of, 2012, a job offer was made and I came on as a, as a sous chef and have been with the company ever since. Every uh, project we've ever opened, been a part of those kitchens and uh, we, we just, we speak the same language around food and I think that's rare, like e even for, you know, talented quality chefs uh, or just chefs of any similar caliber uh, to, to have like the same ideals and kind of thought process and to so easily be able to bounce food ideas off of each other. And then not, not only just food, but you know, I would say most of the anxiety or the headaches or the, the things that myself and Ryan deal with on a daily basis have very little to do with food. And we spoke the same language on food management style ethos, culture that we wanted to kind of set in the kitchen and the restaurant as a whole. Um, and I think right from the get go, Ryan, very talented chef, but his head was so up as far as looking at as a restaurant as a whole and not just kind of a back of the house point of view. Um, and so, yeah, the seed was set. We quickly made Ryan a partner in the restaurant group and, um, he oversees all the kitchens and, um, kind of all the day-to-day -day operations on 
on 20th right now. Did you guys, do you come from the same place? Obviously not geographically, but do you come from, you know, culinary school backgrounds? Do you come from, or is it, and how, how are you guys different or the same as far I, as where you both came from to get um, to where you are? I think that we're both obsessed where food comes from. And that plays a role in how we think about a menu, a concept, um, a, a dish. Uh, it's about like understanding kind of history, background, and um, working with our purveyors, farmers. And when we understand that history, like it, it, it's such a uh, intelligent way to approach the creation of a dish. So. Today's ingredient, uh, the reason I asked that, today's ingredient is really unique because I feel like a lot of what you're doing is Italian influenced, mm -hmm. right? Am I right? Uh, Italian from the public standpoint. From the public, okay. <laughs> also, where we're the same yeah. is we want to we want to sneak in as many different, you know, like worldly products, like, like what the food that we crave. Yeah. Like there is more fish sauce in things at the restaurants than people will ever know. Right. You know? Well, that's funny. We'll talk about anchovies yeah. in a second too. But so today's ingredient is miso. Right. We were walking out of the hotel this morning and John said to me, they picked the ingredient. Mm -hmm. I was like, what is it? Miso. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. an, you know, my first response was like, they're an Italian restaurant. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. why did you want to talk about miso? Yeah. Well, I think a little bit of background, uh, farm water has historically kind of defined we've defined ourselves as having like one foot in italy and the other foot in california and that kind of that not um fusion cuisine but that that mashup of the two and you know being here in the bay area you can't ignore the fact that there's a heavy global influence to the cuisine of san francisco and so like tom was mentioning earlier we we were sneaking things like fish sauce and miso paste into the cuisine for years. But it really wasn't until we uh, birthed Penny Roma down the street, which is a very classic, historical Italian uh, cooking driven restaurant that we said, okay, Flower and Water can start pushing the gas pedal a little bit on allowing a little bit more global influence and expanding our pantry. And that's kind of always been the concept from day one of saying, you know, Italy is, you know, it's not just pasta and Parmesan and balsamic vinegar. Um, and it, it's such a young country. The fact that like no one in Italy says Italian food. No one's like, oh, that's Italian food. It's food from Capania. It's, it's food from the Veneto. I talk about the Veneto, like then trading and when what's going on or what historically what's gone on through there. It's insane, the variety, you know. Bologna, a place that is like near and dear to my heart, like kiwis grow everywhere. And it's like a huge part of like like the 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 dessert dinner table, right? And no one would think like kiwis on an Italian table. You don't think of that as an Italian no. fruit, but I yeah. think they are the world's second largest producer and exporter yeah, yeah, of yeah. kiwi in the world, which yeah. is crazy. Um, and so, you know, for us, I, I think at the beginning, Fire and Water was always let's understand history let's understand where this dish comes from let's not f with that too much right let's not like like really try to like do fusion cuisine let's put our own little stamp on it and think of food in italy is thought of as regional and we live in a region in california that is really unique and let's play let, let's pay homage to both of those things i love that and so how are you sorry i was just gonna say one thing that we instill in all of our our kitchen managers because at this point we're really managing chefs and sous chefs as our our restaurant group grows one thing we instill in them is if you want to mess around and add your you know quote unquote chef touch to a dish you have to first understand the the history behind what you're changing to appreciate it and honor it and then yes we can sneak in things like the miso paste so what is miso paste for anyone listening who does not know easiest quickest way to describe it uh it is cooked soybeans that have been inoculated with a, a rice mold called koji and left to slowly ferment what you're left with is this slightly sweet slightly salty 
paste that adds a ton of umami, which is that, that, that savory quality to food. And uh, for us, we started to look at the traditional uh, umami laden products of Italy. And uh, Italy doesn't get a lot of attention for umami like Asian countries do. Like most people think of like soy sauce and miso or fish sauce as these like really umami rich products. Uh, one of the trays that I have here in front of all of us just kind of shows off umami rich products of Italy. A couple of anchovy products with some cured fillets that are uh, packed in olive oil. Uh, another anchovy product called Culatera de Lici, or in Rome they call it garum, which is ancient fish sauce basically. It's yeah. fish sauce. Yeah. It is fish mm -hmm. sauce. Parmigiano Reggiano, you know, aged for a couple of years, ton of glutamic acid, umami flavor. Tomatoes, especially when they get uh, fire roasted and packed in oil, like these uh, Sardinian version, balsamic vinegar, Tajiosca olive, like Italian cuisine is rich, rich in, in umami. And so for us, it was actually quite natural to introduce miso subtly into the food of flour and water because it's really just playing off of something that's already embedded in that style of cuisine. It, it, for me, it's a depth of flavor that it adds. Um, and I, I, I struggle to think of, I think there's few and far dishes that would not be enhanced by adding a dab of miso. Yeah. I always feel the things with umami make me, they, uh, the, even the thought of them makes me salivate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or whatever, you know? I'm sitting here and I want to open that can of anchovies and just <laughs> start it, eating them. It's crazy. I, I didn't know this. There's actually an umami sensitivity. Um, and my, I think my oldest daughter has it. And so, like, there's things, even I, if I put, like, a little hint, like, I'm always, like, I'll sneak a little in the mm -hmm. mac and cheese and make it a little bit more mac and cheesy. Mm -hmm. um, and she's so sensitive to it. She picks wow. up on She it. picks up. Yeah. That's very cool. I mean, it was funny that you were talking about sneaking anchovy sauce and colatora uh, into dishes because one of the things, Andrea and I believe that everybody loves anchovies. They just don't oh, know totally. that or they oh, don't yeah, admit yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Just don't tell um, them. Yeah, this mm -hmm. podcast was actually going to be called The Anchovy. And then mm -hmm. we had a couple people go, oh, mm -hmm. I don't think that's a good idea because no. not everybody likes anchovies. But it turns out we find that almost everybody loves them. Oh, yeah. And We've you only guys, had one you're guest. You're living proof doesn't. of it. You've been hiding it into the dishes yeah, yeah, or yeah. working it in there and folding it in. Tell us about those dishes. I mean, for, for, for us, the, um, a dish has to have depth, right? And that depth, you know, do the only the only way to achieve depth is layering flavors, right? And uh, layering flavors takes balance, and so you don't a highly, you know, don't just add lemon juice until it's like crazy acidic. It takes right. like the right balance, sure. um, and I think that the same thing is certainly true with umami. You know, there is nothing. I mean, talk about hiding anchovies. If you take a a roast, a leg of lamb, a leg of pork, whatever, stud it with garlic and anchovies and just allow that umami paste to like slowly roast into it. God damn, it is the it will make your pork taste more porky. You yep. know? Um I love it with lamb. Yeah. Anchovies totally. and lamb. Um let's go back to miso. So how are you guys using that in the restaurants? And are you buying, you know, traditional Japanese miso? Are you doing anything to it? Or are you no, making no. your own You're doing miso? it on your own? So our, our relationship with, uh, with miso and then another product that we love, uh, not necessarily the star of today's show, but uh, Shio Koji, another Koji Kin inoculated rice product. Um, it started with uh, companies like the Chef's Warehouse uh, introducing us to imported nice miso nice paste. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, we that appreciate that. Plug. Thank you. Great plug. <laughs> and, and then another one, uh, the Japanese pantry, um, uh, San Francisco chef, terrible uh, based plug. company. Terrible mm. plug. That was not, that was not <laughs> a good one. <laughs> um, but Greg Dunmore uh, of Japanese pantry kind of showed us the, the broad nature of, of different miso pastes of Japan. And so we were dabbling at that point. But it wasn't until uh, we found out about a new local company called Shared Cultures that is doing artisanal small batch miso pastes, basically one neighborhood over. And they, uh, they really have influenced our food. And they're kind of taking miso paste from a, a seasonal angle where they're introducing, uh, again, small batch, micro season driven products into the miso making process. And... Uh, 
through that relationship, we've actually started to collaborate on a couple of products. Uh, the first one that we did that is already released is a Tajaska olive miso paste. Which Love it. Tajaska Sounds olives. delicious. Already has umami, has, has salt, and so they're able to reduce the amount of actual salt in the miso making process. And so they're doing projects with us, or really I should say for us. And, uh, you know, we don't necessarily have the facility or or the labor power to do do these things in-house, but having that relationship with a local company has been really beneficial for us. And uh, the next one they're working on is a Parmigiano-Reggiano miso paste. And so in four to five months, you'll see on the flour and water menu, hopefully, uh, this, this Parm miso in its sneaky ways throughout the menu is just like that umami bomb. But I want to know how you add that in. Like, tell me about a specific dish and how you're going to sneak it in. I mean, think about each uh, each pasta that that we, um, you know, for for us, it's really important. Uh, pasta's cooked 80% of the way in heavily salted water, 20% in the the finished sauce. Um, that sauce, I would say, for us, 95% of the time uh, is balanced with some sort of acid, right? Um, and you know, to have uh, to have a menu, we have eight a la carte pastas, and then we do a pasta tasting menu that has five different pastas on it. Right? That pasta tasting menu is a has to be a journey of different textures and how they relate to flavors. Um, we don't just want a great parm on every single top. Uh, you know, it's like you know we want to show show off different textures and, and flavors to it, but. Parmesan Reggiano miso. There's not a single thing that comes out of the kitchen from like finishing a like just a dab, finishing a pasta sauce with it, uh, soups. I mean, there, there's like my favorite thing to do in the world, and I think the secret for an amazing grilled cheese is two things: it has to be mayo on the outside of the mm -hmm. bread, um, and a very small slathering of miso on the inside. Ooh, um, I, I want to try oh, that. Man. We know oh, the man. mayo. Yeah. We know the mayo. We're big yeah, mayo yeah, fans. Yeah, yeah, that, I'm the most miso. excited for the Parmesan. For the Parm miso, mac and, or, uh, mac and cheese or uh, but, uh, grilled cheese. But So it just adds then, this layer of you know flavor and this and richness complexity. and complexity. Yeah, like an intensity. Yeah. And so you're just spooning out a dollop of yeah. it and putting it in there and it's just, yeah. okay, wow. Like I always tell like young cooks too, like if you're making... We, we never have it on the menu here, but if you're doing like a pureed soup, right? And you're doing like a pureed sunchoke soup and you make it and you do you go through a whole, like the whole process and you're like, it's kind of bland. And then you add acid to it. And you're like, well, it's bland. And all of a sudden it's sharp. There's not a depth to it. Like that's what you have to find uh, as a cook, as a chef, that depth of flavor. Um, if you need or want a shortcut, Miso will help you get there. Right? Is this brand new? Like, did you guys decide this when you met the company that was making the miso? Or have you been doing this for years and it's like been a little bit of your own secret here? Or did uh, you see this in Italy? I don't, think we, I don't think we made any of this up. That's it, for you know, sure. It, it's been, uh, I think it's been amplified by this new local company. Yep. But it's always been something that we were okay doing as long as, again, we knew the history behind the pasta or the dish we were representing or honoring from Italy um, and but you weren't in the we, kitchen and, of Roscioli in Rome and then all of a sudden you're like doing a little no, stage there no, and you're no, like no. oh what's this chef uh, no. this is, I've never really seen uh, it, it, miso, miso in, totally. used yeah. in Italy it, it's so funny too because like Penny Roma if we do a cacio e pepe like cacio e pepe is going to be better if you put a little miso in there like there are so many Italians that just tuned out but we're not going to do yeah. it <laughs> But we're, Penny Roma. Penny we're, not Roma, we're not going to do it, right? And like that is like You're the intention honor the of that, there. that honor the tradition. Flour and water from day one has always been a little I inventive, you know, a little edgier, um, a little you kind of like pushing the boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so we could talk about cacio e pepe for a while because oh yeah, there's mm. you got favorite Penny pasta. Roma man. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, some other ways that we incorporate miso paste into our, our pasta making downstairs here at Flour and Water, uh, treating it like tomato paste in a braise, where like currently we're doing this uh, milk braised pork sugo, and uh, in a traditional braise you would have tomato paste, uh, but wanting that to come out, the, 
in a certain appearance, putting tomato paste in a milk braise can be a little pink. So by adding a little bit of miso paste, you're achieving the same umami savoriness as tomato paste and keeping it blonde. Um, and at that point, it helps with consistency as well. Like sure. t- tomato paste is about background and umami and, and depth, but it's also about consistency of the finished braise. I feel like you guys really think about umami like in every dish. Oh, that we're making you... this up as we go along here. This <laughs> is this is no. <laughs> no I, I mean, like I'm kind of uh, like yeah. I mean, I've never it, really it thought is... about it this much. Like you hear about a dish on a menu that has umami. Yeah. Like it seems like it really influences your entire menu and like your way of like planning and thinking and yeah all those things i I think you can interject depth with umami yeah right like when i hear umami i think depth Mm -hmm. and so a lot of that food downstairs that we're cooking we want a lot of depth to it um miso is like you know it's and cooking is balancing like when you're when you're seasoning food and uh doing it properly or well you're you're hitting balance uh, in, in a in a way that makes flavors pop, and salt is the easiest, most obvious, maybe seasoning technique to master, and then you learn acid balance and how that affects fat and mm-hmm. salt, and uh, thinking about food with not just salt acid, but adding umami, you you start to hit these really really complex flavors that kind of the the amateur or new to cooking cook doesn't realize and amplifies these flavors so let's talk about you guys mentioned it you're going to be doing the uh retail line of pasta Mm -hmm. where are you getting the flour from like where is this produced how are you doing this yeah um and what's the brand name is it flour and water we we, we were we try not to talk about the pandemic anymore right because everyone's like sick of hearing it um but you know two years ago we were like what are we doing all the restaurants are shut down we had um, this amazing opportunity to think about how we wanted to move forward. Was this your COVID baby? This is the COVID. This is, this is one, one of many one COVID. Of. Yeah, yeah, one of many this COVID babies. This podcast is John and my COVID baby. <laughs> yeah. So we get it. We had one of many. And um, we, we, we got to rethink everything. We went from 250 employees to, uh, to five partners. Um, and we're like, what are we doing moving forward? And we pivoted just like so many people have done, you know, we're doing food to go and, um, but we're like, what, what do we want to do big picture? And we started to talk about our reach as a hospitality group and also our impact. And so we, we want to have an impact on, and this is like lofty, I like to say it's lofty, not cocky. Um, we want to impact how wheat is grown in America. Uh, on a much much larger scale and so that um that for us pointed us in developing a line of dried pasta that is organic uh one percent of each box sold goes to zero food print um and then we can start to develop and understand um and barter how that wheat is grown so that's um, lovely yeah and the ingredients are literally flour and water it's semolina and water. And, and that's, that's it. the brand as well? Flour and water pasta. We're going to release with four shapes. Um, and it's a balance of like what we love to cook and what's accessible to the home cook. So spaghetti, um, campanile, um, macaroni elbows, and penne. Yeah. Great. Right. And obviously artisan production, slow drying times. For the slow production. drying times. I mean, one of the, the two biggest factors for us, is, well, three, is where the wheat comes from. Um, uh, that wheat being organic wheat. Um, the slow drying times uh, has to be um, bronze dye extruded. Can't wait to try it. Yeah. yeah. I, I was going to say earlier <clears throat> when you were asking Uh, about us focusing on umami more than maybe most restaurants uh it it is true that we focus on that but for for tom and i we actually obsess over texture more so than acid salt umami balance and if if we're allowed to pick a non-ingredient secret ingredient for this show it is texture we we talk about it constantly and it's so important to how a dish is perceived and you know, in, in the pasta world, how that sauce grabs onto a noodle, it's so, so important. 
And the only way to achieve that is with the bronze dye. I think a lot of consumers and a lot of people think fresh pasta is something special, something better than dry. And, you know, I like to talk a little bit about that. The difference is there's a time and a place for fresh pasta and there's a time and a place for dried pasta. It's um, almost, maybe this is like a little, little too extreme. It breaks my heart sometimes mm-hmm. when I have like a fresh spaghetti. I want, you know, yeah, with a, a cacio e pepe. You, you totally. I mean, they're, they're, it's, this, it's a similar product, but it's two different products. Um, and uh, the outcome is like radically, radically different. And, you know, if you're we're talking about like regionally and try to find fresh pasta in Southern Italy, it, it doesn't really exist, right? It's not a part of their culture there. Maybe and a little orchiette from time exactly, to time. Exactly. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, and, you know, central to Northern Italy is egg and egg yolk based pastas. We want our pappardelle, which is central to Northern Italy based pasta. I want it to taste like it has butter in it. We push the envelopes of the amount of egg yolks that we put into that pasta, and it's so incredibly, incredibly rich. Um, I, I don't want that with like a seafood-based olive oil sauce, right? It doesn't, you know, it, it's it, they're two completely different things. And then also the sensitivity to cooking fresh pasta at home. I think people are extremely intimidated by it. It's a pain in the ass. The window for error is, is, uh, is much different. Um, and it's interesting what, you know, America has done for both pasta and pizza. And I would say there's few, few of you, you know, nine out of 10 Americans, whether you're wherever your background, your age, probably have a box of pasta in their cupboard. Right. And it's like really a part of like an American, it's, it's an American staple. Well, speaking of staples, if I were to ask you, I mean, obviously you, you cook at home, or you, you mentioned you have kids. What are the five pantry staples that you have to have at all times in your? You want to go one for one on this? Okay. Uh, I'm going to first, we have a ridiculous amount of hot sauce. Okay. I think a hot shot of something different hits almost every single plate in our in our house. Like depending on what you've made. Totally. Yeah. But it's green. Is it red? Mm-hmm. Is it you know? Is hot it sauce? is it yeah. vinegar? One, huh? Number okay. one. Hot Interesting. Sauce. That's yeah. a, that that you surprised me. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, I, have I love three, when I have to change the theme of the show. Yeah. I have three. What's your favorite um, hot sauce? Well, what are we putting it on? You know what I mean? I mean is it fresh pasta? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> is it dried? No. Mm. Um, I have three things of hot sauce in my car. Nice. Yeah. All right. I'd say my go to my go to is pretty plain Jane. It's um sriracha. Same. And I will put sriracha on. I feel like I've eggs every morning. Sriracha. I'm not to sound like snobby, but it doesn't do it for me anymore. I used to love putting sriracha on my eggs and everything. Uh huh. I don't know if something happened mm-hmm. in my palate where I just I crave doesn't... it. But you like more of like a I'll vinegary put loose on a bon or me. Like that's a vin- about it now for me. Uh huh. For my first pantry staple, I'm gonna say uh, a good high quality extra virgin olive oil that is your workhorse oil yeah something oh yeah something that has character and bite and a little bit of bitterness but is still floral and grassy so i'm not talking like that like super tuscan like not like a finishing oil you're talking about like your everyday every day something Mm -hmm. that that just works well uh we use this amazing uh brand here from uh, Northern California called Seca Hills. And it's an Arborquina based extra virgin. And it's just, uh, I go through gallons of it at home. Nice. So we had hot sauce, we had olive oil. What else? I, th- I feel like we have to throw miso paste into yeah, this I mean, conversation. Oh, right. Come on. <laughs> yeah. How many different types of miso paste, I mean, on average, do you have so, at uh, your disposal? So I put out a tray as far as the restaurant. Uh, that's the five that we're currently using okay and again that's from you know small batch producer at at home i I really just need one like light white or yellow miso paste something that's gonna have that little bump of flavor Mm -hmm. in whatever we're cooking okay we need two more we need two more all right we have uh we have fat we have spice we have salt and umami uh other pantry Oh, Oh, he's back one of my (laughs) one of my the second after hot sauce is uh uh, citrus. Nice. Like I need lemon or lime. Like I need to squeeze a lemon acidity. or lime mm-hmm. on on most things. Yeah. I like that. 
It's a good one. Good call. And then uh, if we're talking purely at home cooking, one of my, I don't know if it's a guilty pleasure, if it's acceptable, but QP mayonnaise oh, yeah. sure. on everything. So yeah. good. It's so Love good. It. I mean, talk about another like sneaky umami bomb in your cooking. Mm-hmm. It's just, uh, I love the flavor and the versatility and uh, it's always in the fridge. Let's face the fact that mayonnaise makes the world go round. It's I mean, it was mentioned earlier amazing. with the grilled cheese. It is so good. I love it. I mean, I, I, lo- I love it. I'm a it. QP and Hellman's, Hellman's or Best Foods guy. Yeah, my, my brother is one of those people that doesn't like creamy white condiments. My and sister is the same way. Like, you are missing out on I'm like, you're a, a monster. world of flavor. You're a yeah. monster. You are a monster. The last one, uh, a, f- a flaky coarse sea salt, whether it's like Jacobson mm-hmm. uh, uh, yep. Crystal Flakes or like Florida Cell. Uh, we, we use one from Colima, Mexico called Marisol that's just like the, the perfect finishing salt. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for us, seasoning obviously is such an important part of cooking yeah. that to, to finish, whether it's a vegetable or a piece of meat at home with a good sea salt, that's something that my pantry can't live without. Awesome. Thomas talked about having three hot sauces in his car. Yesterday, we went out to lunch um, and I pulled out a Jacobson's little travel tin. Oh, yeah. From my purse. And she was, travels with I her travel own salt. With salt. Well, well, this has been awesome. Thanks so much, Ryan. Thanks so much, Thomas. Uh, we're at Flower and Water in San Francisco talking about miso paste. I never thought we'd be doing that in a restaurant that specializes in pasta, but this has been really eye opening and a lot of fun. And we're going to get cooking now? Of course, we're going to get cooking. Let's I'd love, do it. I'd love for y'all to try something. Let's All do right. it. Thanks so much. Thank All you. Right. Take care. Thanks for having Bye. us. Kevin Gondo and Elena Sue from Shared Cultures in San Francisco. Hey guys. So nice to have you guys here. Hi. Hey. We are going to tell us about tell us about Shared Cultures. You guys are making miso, but you're making other stuff too. What how did the company start? Yeah, so we're a small fermentation company based here in San Francisco, and we really specialize in fermenting misos using local and seasonal ingredients that we're getting from our farmers markets. But we also ferment like a lentil quinoa shoyu, and we make umami seasonings, um, koji salts, and um, we, what else do we do? And we do like preserved tomatoes, sometimes pickles, but those are all very small batch. We really focus on our, our seasonal misos. How did you, this is a really beautiful small business. Uh, we were introduced to you by Kyle McNaughton. Um, From Flower and Water. The, the chefs in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did you guys get started in this business? It was a journey, actually. I mean, we initially, we had no idea we were going to do this. It really was a hobby that really stemmed from for, like our love for foraging. Um, Kevin and I are both mu- avid mushroom hunters. And um, actually, our first mushroom miso we ever made was a morel mushroom miso. And, you know, you just, when you start, when you're in the woods and you're looking for things, you start realizing, huh, I have a lot of mushrooms. I don't know what to do with them. And, you know, we started going to the books and reading about food preservation and food fermentation. And we read about koji, and koji is a fungus that's been preserving foods for over 3,000 years. And we thought it would be a really fun idea to kind of ferment fungus with fungus or fungi with fungi. And, um, you know, that's kind of how the mushroom misos were born, was just really from having an excess of, you know, things that we're finding in the forest. And kind of from there, it just spiraled into, oh, well, if we can ferment mor- morels, maybe we can ferment, you know, vegetables, or maybe we can ferment, um, you know, seaweed. I don't know, just every, you know, whatever the bounty of Northern California really has to offer, we really figured um, it would be fun to kind of unlock that um, through fermentation. That's really neat. Miso, I feel miso is having a moment. Totally, very, like now. Mm-hmm. So is koji. Yeah, but I feel uh, like miso it used to be either you had white miso mm-hmm. or red miso, and that's kind of all you saw I, I, for a while, unless you were at like a specialty, you know, market. Um, tell us a little bit about the evolution and and you know why it's having a moment and how you guys um, maybe approach miso differently. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, you're exactly right. Most people are familiar with um, white and red miso at their grocery stores. Um, there are many different types and styles of miso. And so 
um, you know, out of all the different types of miso, we specialize in something called the kome miso, uh, kome miso style, uh, which is rice based. Um, you also have barley style, which is mugi miso, um, or amame style, which is uh, soy based. And within those different styles, or different types, rather, you can have different styles. So uh, a white miso, for example, is you know other also known as a shiro style miso, um, has a higher percentage of carbohydrates or starches. Um, so that ferments into uh, sugar, and so those are typically your sweeter misos. Typically, you know, a shorter fermentation time, lower percentage of salt. And then, the, then on the other end of the spectrum, you have your red misos, which are more savory, more funky, more umami, and that's because they have more protein that ferments into amino acids, which is umami. And those are generally, you know, fermented for a longer period of time, anywhere between, you know, eight to 12 months to two to three years. And um, those have a higher percentage of salt to carry it through. And so, um, you know, we've really seen kind of a resurgence of these new varieties of miso, um, you know, from our end of the world that that just incorporates ingredients that we're familiar with, um, you know, things like honey nut squash or morel mushrooms or things that we have available to us um, here in, in Northern California. Um, and although, you know, we do everything, uh, we ferment everything within the same traditional fashion, um, these non-traditional ingredients are, are really just a way to explore uh, flavor through fermentation. And so I think that is becoming more um, just well-known in general that you can kind of create different nuances of, of flavor and um, excitement, <clears throat> excitement rather, um, with, uh, you know, with what you have available. Can you walk us through kind of like the start to finish yeah. of how to make this? Like, I'm just trying to picture this sitting for eight months. Like, how does it, how does it happen? Definitely. Um, so as a general overview, uh, miso fermentation is a two stage fermentation process. Um, in the first stage, you are focused on growing something called koji, which is a mold fungi. Um, unlike, um, unlike a portobello or a shiitake mushroom, you know, it doesn't, not, it does not have a, a fruiting body. So, um, it's a filamentous mold fungi that breaks down uh, protein into umami and, and starches into sugar. And it's responsible for fermenting miso, soy sauce, sake, um, all these wonderful ferments that we're all familiar with. Um, and so in the first stage, you're, you're focused on growing that. And in our style of miso, um, again, we, we, we specialize in, uh, fermenting a kome style miso, which is rice-based. Um, we grow the koji rice. And so that's a 48 hour process. Um, it, it's, it's one of the most important processes of miso fermentation, because that's where, um, you're creating all of these enzymes to, uh, be the catalyst for fermentation. And so once you have all those enzymes, um, you have your koji, um, then you mix all of your ingredients together. Um, and so that's, that's typically when we, in, in, um, when we mix in, you know, a type of bean, traditionally it's soybeans, but really you just need that protein source. Um, so we're exploring non-traditional ingredients such as navy beans or chickpeas or, um, you know, just different varieties. Um, and, you know, depending on the flavor of miso that we're, we're incorporating, um, for example, the mirepoix miso that Elena just mentioned, um, will in, 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 uh, incorporate roasted vegetables at that time uh, with salt. And so you mix all that together, you put it in a fermentation vessel, um, and it and it and it does its thing. The microbes go to work for anywhere between two months to upwards of eight months in our, in, in certain misos. Um, and what's happening is all that starch, the proteins are breaking down. Um, you know, there's a lot of bacteria and yeast that are creating these de delicious flavors uh, from all these ingredients. So, really, the microbes are kind of the the hard workers uh, at that time. And then by the end of that that period, um, what you have in in your fermentation vessel is is what we consider miso. Amazing. How did you learn how to do yeah. this? Did you is miso Japanese? Is it, is it historically? <laughs> Jap it is Japanese in it. Well, it's known it's known to be a Japanese condiment, but actually originated in China three thousand years ago. So yeah. three thousand years ago in the Zhao Dynasty, they were fermenting with koji, but they were fermenting things that they had um, 
at that time. And that actually consisted of ant eggs, birds, rodents, anything that they could really hunt and gather, they were fermenting with this filamentous fungi. And so what's really interesting is, you know, it, what ended up happening was 2,000 years later, it got brought into Japan by a traveling monk. Um, and the first iteration of that was really a mix between soy sauce and miso. It was really thick soy sauce, but really runny miso. And so the Japanese being um, who they are, they really wanted to perfect it, this perfect this condom and they thought, huh, why don't we press it and we can get a paste, miso paste, and then why don't, and then on the other side, that's how you get soy sauce. Um, and so that's where the, the separation of this, uh, of two, one condiment becoming two um, occurred 2,000 years ago. And the reason why we associate miso with really a Japanese condiment is because they were the ones to really perfect this craft. And they were the ones who really introduced simple ingredients such as soybeans and rice and barley. These are the things that they had. Um, and actually rice-based ferments um, back in the day was actually only reserved for royalty because rice based, um, rice is a very intensive crop to grow. And in order to, and rice was really reserved for, for, you know, the king, the imperial families or really wealthy families. Um, and so that's kind of how, why we know miso today as like rice, barley, or, you know, soybean based, um, because the evolution is just so much closer to where we are than 3000 years ago in China when they were fermenting um, all sorts of different things. And how did you, yeah. is this something and, that you and, researched? Um, yeah, I guess. And to answer your We learned from books, honestly. Yeah. Uh, we've learned from books. Uh, we reached out to, we started reading Sander Katz's Art of Fermentation. And then from there, we checked out the book of Miso um, by Will uh, Bill Sherloff. And, you know, and after that, I actually took a class, uh, flew out um, to to Maine at that time. And I met Rich Shi, who wrote Koji Alchemy. This was before the book came out. I took a workshop with him. And then I also then took a workshop with, um, with Jeremy Mansky up at Larder B, who's also the co-author of Koji Alchemy before the books came out. And it was just really this perfect timing of things. Um, you know, the Noma book had just recently come out and people were really interested in fermentation. And we had just kind of gotten into it through our, through, you know, through this natural, through our hobbies. Um, and, you know, by taking a few classes here and there and then consulting the books and just, that just makes perfect, I think. <laughs> you know, we're, we're no, you know, not by any means perfect, but, you know, in our craft, we're still trying to get better. I mean, we recently went to Japan in October uh, for a whole month to study under Miso Masters just to really see how they were doing it. And we learned so much. Um, but, you know, every day is always, you know, trying to tweak little things, put systems in place. To, to you know to hopefully make the best me so we can here in san francisco are yeah, you guys we, going we to toured, the floor? i was just gonna say yeah we toured um uh, many miso and shoyu factories from you know fukui to toyama and osaka and basically around japan for for an entire month and, and we, we learned an immense amount of um the traditional practices from these small makers i mean in in japan uh miso fermentation on a small scale um, is unfortunately a dying industry. Um, it's it's one that is facing a lot of challenges from the large manufacturers that can produce miso for you know four dollars a, a tub. <laughs> um, you know it's, it's very very labor intensive, very um, just resource demanding, and even the labor um, in Japan, for example, the you know the, these miso businesses that have been around for seven to 10 generations there, you know, the next generations are flocking to urban centers for uh, more white collar jobs. And so for us uh, to, to preserve those traditional fermentation practices is, is quite meaningful to us and what we're doing um, because, because it's something that, um, you know, that, that, that needs to be preserved. And today, so you're going to the farmer's markets, you're available in retail stores. Tell us about where consumers can get your products. Yeah, so we actually have a very small retail presence. Um, we uh, most of the time people can just find us through our website. It's www.share-cultures.com, and we ship all throughout the United States. We've even shipped to Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and Alaska, which 
I think is really, really cool. Um, but on our website for Bay Area, um, you know, we have a few retail locations. We have a Find Our Ferments page. So, you know, on that site, we actually have a place where people can go on there and check what kind of stores, uh, what, you know, what stores we're in. And so, and restaurants in the Bay Area are just yeah. working with you directly. Yeah. So in San Francisco, we have restaurant um, Flower and Water, and we also have restaurant Greens. Um, we also, you know, in the East Bay, we have restaurant Snail Bar and Pomet. Um, you know, we have a few, we have a few other like Michelin star restaurants as well, working with us, um, uh, restaurant Nisei here in San Francisco, um, Comey and East Bay and even California is here in San Francisco. So we work with a, with a great variety of, um, maybe 24 restaurants right now so far. And we love being a part of that. I think it's really cool to be able to provide chefs with a really great, um, seasonal and local product that, you know, through fermentation, it's just essentially, um, there's so many different tastes and flavors that uh, fermentation really cultivates. And we're just excited to be able to offer a new type of seasoning or flavor. Uh, yeah. Into yeah. the space. And, so. and a lot of more people are becoming aware of, of um, how wonderful miso can be as, as a general umami seasoning. I mean, seeing it in pastas or, you know, we work with the a business called Rose Pizzeria at Berkeley. They put it in Caesar salad. And, yeah. you know, it's not just a condiment for soup. And for us, um, that that's very exciting to see. Yeah. Even pastas like at day trip, they're always doing a seasonal type of uh, pasta dish at, in Oakland and they feature our misos. And they just got done with the, um, we just did, what was the last uh, miso we provided them? I think it was a honey nut squash miso for the winter time. And now that spring's coming around the corner, we're going to be supplying our morel miso to them. So it's really fun to see what kind of, you know, pastas and things they make with our, with our misos on the menu. It's always changing. So does that, oh, sorry, sorry, what I was going to say is, does that really take on the flavor of the morel too when you when you have it? I think that they try to create dishes that really complement each other. You know, with spring coming around the corner, you do kind of taste the morels, but they almost get transformed. I think the morel miso is really almost meaty. It, mm -hmm. it kind of tastes like a but the proteins from that just really ferment into something different. So it's like morel adjacent, if, if that makes sense. It like yeah. it, it tastes for me, it almost tastes like a steak. It's it's really interesting what fermentation does um, to the to the mushrooms. Like the, we we make a chanterelle miso, for example, and the chanterelles that really just evolves into almost like a stone fruit flavor. Like you right. like the, the proteins and the mushrooms. Kind of when you smell them. it, it almost mm -hmm. yeah. But it gets really just fast forward. Like it just you smell it and you just smell. I smell apricots right away. It's really interesting. Um, so it's been really cool to be able to offer these ingredients. Um, yeah, to restaurants. Do chefs ever approach you and say, "I want you to make a tomato miso," or you know? you know, kind of throwing out ingredients or are they typically coming to you and you're telling them, you know, <laughs> what, what you have cooking, if you will? I think it depends. I mean, we've had some requests and we've, we've done those requests. We recently did a chickpea and sumac miso um, for a rest uh, restaurant in Berkeley called Lulu's. Um, so we're really excited to see that. And we've gotten a request for, you know, like a mung bean miso by a Thai restaurant. And so it, you know, we, we try to accommodate requests, but, you know, for the most part, I think um, most people are just interested, you know, if, if they work with us and they're great friends of ours, we're happy, we're happy to honor them. But um, currently, you know, as we start working with restaurants, usually they're just ordering what we have. And then um, if there's an idea that's exciting, um, like Flower and Water had recently asked us to, they get a lot of uh, the little, like the Parmesan rinds, like that might be fun to do um, to, you know, because when they, you know, in the restaurants, they have a lot of Parmesan rinds. So they thought it'd be interesting to see what could happen to that. And we did an um, olive and we did an olive, olive miso for, for them. And yeah. And, and the other day, well, three weeks ago, we did a bread miso uh, for one of our restaurant partners, Snail Bar, um, because they have so much excess bread at the end of service that they were really trying to preserve that. So we definitely, do kind of small projects here and there. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, it's, sometimes it's tough to accommodate, but we're happy to, to do it because it is really fun to explore flavor um, with our friends. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate, uh, you know, you being here with us. If you're interested in any of these products, please go to share-cultures.com and 
I can't wait to try them myself. I don't know. I need to buy you the Morel one. I want to go mushroom hunting with these guys. <laughs> it was a real <laughs> pleasure having you here. Thanks so much. And uh, what a great, really informative yeah, conversation cool. about miso. The only thing I ever knew about miso soup up until a couple of years ago was miso soup. And, you know, I would go to Nobu restaurant and get their black cod with yeah, miso. Yeah, the black cod miso, yeah. You know. Yes, so. yes. It's really come a long way, and it's you know in the United States. So it's really amazing to hear what you guys are doing at Shared Cultures. Thank you again. We really appreciate your Thank time. You. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Yeah. yeah thank Thanks you. for having us. Thanks for listening to this episode of Ingredient Insiders. Follow us on Instagram at Ingredient Insiders. You can find the products we discussed on today's episode at ChefsWarehouse.com or at your favorite specialty retailer.